Welcome to one of Cambridge University's most famous traditions, the May Ball. Balls themselves cost up to £300 for a ticket and have budgets exceeding £100,000. The St John's budget even hitting £400,000 according to a varsity study. These balls come with another price however. The environmental cost of our opulent end of term fun is also shocking. Unlimited food and drink comes with unlimited packaging and much of the production equipment and novelties are single use. This is the Cambridge Climate! experiences of maples, like the amount of waste that immediately kind of conjures up. The only two things I've heard about it is that on one hand they're just lavish and extravagant, but on the other hand that they just produce so much waste that apparently afterwards when you just walk through, you know, a scene of a, of a mayball, it's just completely filled with litter. You know, obviously the maples is kind of notoriously extravagant, there's um, a huge amount of potential for waste, you've got contractors coming in from potentially all over the country. Realistically, Cambridge is not going to throw away this long-standing tradition. Just as Caesarian Sunday traditions are not likely to stop, leaving rubbish strewn across Cambridge's parks like a post-festival horror show. However, in February this year, following a petition for every ball committee to have a sustainability officer, Kusu passed the measure to encourage May balls to become more sustainable. Some individuals in the university have been trying to bring about sustainable balls for over the last two years, in particular the sustainable team and the Mayball committees themselves. Firstly, our production company, VME, um, they're really great. So it's a company that um, the 2016 ball used. The company has a carbon neutral policy, so um, they offset their own carbon. Attractions we've decided to go for this year actually don't use electricity, so we're hoping to have um, a health skelter and uh, swing boats, which both don't require power, so um, you can still have fun without the without the need for dodgems or something that drains a lot of mm -hmm. um, power. Then in terms of carbon, I've put quite a lot of effort into kind of trying to stay away from the likes of beef and lamb, um, which are obviously massive producers of CO2. So we're kind of trying to support um, sustainable initiatives, um, working in the events industry, local contractors, and working also um, working with local contractors to um, where they haven't previously thought about sustainable issues to try and raise their awareness of that. Sustainable actually came from Amy Carmichael, who was one of the sustainability officers for the 2016 Mabel. And they've provided a really, really amazing um, framework and um, guidebook. So they have an accreditation scheme based on the measures that were put into place in 2016 with Room to Innovate as well. And it's been a really good platform to collaborate with other balls and especially sharing design and things like that because all the balls are spaced out throughout the week. So if a ball that's been on the Friday, um, so we're on the Monday, so they might have had the ball on the Friday and then we can use some of their design um, for the Monday and then pass that on. Um, not just design, we could sell on carpet and a whole host of things that um, works out better for us as well because it can often work out um, cheaper if you're mm -hmm. resource sharing. So actually it's a win-win situation. The 2016 Claire May Ball was Cambridge's first carbon neutral ball um, and this is an idea that came from the president who was really passionate about, um, about the environment but also about how that can increase the appeal of a, of a product. Um, it will make people excited about the ball to know that it's environmentally friendly and he brought myself and Alejandro who is an environmental engineer on board to the committee of sustainability directors to take on the rather challenging task of running a carbon neutral ball. A lot of people worried that it was going to be rubbish um, but most people, in fact yeah everybody loved the balls. I think as long as you see it as a kind of potential to be creative and not limiting then it doesn't have to restrict anything. Food anyway, it hasn't been restrictive at all. I think in any way it's kind of inspired us to be a bit more creative. So for the ice cream flavours, um, we're actually using some of the botanicals from Fair Gardens. Fun can be sustainable. Environmentalism does not have to be an impact on your daily life. In fact, it can be a source of creativity, be that how you run your college ball, considering holiday options that don't include flying, or finding new recipes to reduce the impact of your eating habits. Hello, my name's uh, Emma Garnett, I'm a PhD student in the zoology department and my research is on how can we make western diets more sustainable, more environmentally friendly as well as healthier and the easiest way of doing that is shifting f to a more plant-based diet. 
so reducing your animal product consumption so that's meat dairy in particular and especially beef and lamb which have a very very large carbon footprint animal agriculture contributes around 15 to 18 percent to climate change I mean to greenhouse gas emissions and that is a significant number when you think about all the other contributors in transportation and I think making a daily choice about what you eat is such an easy decision compared to for example whether or not you have to take an airplane to go somewhere there are certain parts of the food industry uh, which have got a lot to say for themselves we've been hoodwinked over the generations into thinking that that beef and lamb and a few other meats are um, perfectly okay uh, but on a planet which is struggling with climate change I don't think they are okay. Within the university we've been working closely with different colleges and other caterers to uh, encourage a more vegetarian and vegan menu and I think we're really starting to see a tipping point and that has been driven a lot by the universities and undergraduates in the universities and Veganuary has had a huge amount of publicity this year which we're able to engage with the colleges about and really um, bring about change. calculated that if the 10% of the greatest emitters um, were to adopt a lifestyle similar to that of the average European, then global emissions would drop by a third. Now that's a massive prize to be had and that's not asking for people to give up flying, it's saying if you take one medium range flight per year uh, it does mean that you don't eat meat every day, uh, but these are fairly small adjustments. So personal actions can have a big impact, and the main ones are if you fly, then try not to fly, fly much less. Um, adopt a plant-based diet and try not to drive, those are the biggies. Mm. Another individual action which recurred in the advice from our interviewees was the importance of cutting down the impact of our transport, especially flying. Flying is a big problem and personally for me it's a really big problem because I grew up in Australia and that's where well, most of my um, family are. Um, so I do like to go and visit, I like to go to weddings, I, you know, occasionally there are funerals, occasionally there are all sorts of reasons to go, but I probably shouldn't. So do you disown your family? really hard decision to make. I would 
advise anybody who's sort of thinking ahead is don't live too far away from your family because if you do you're going to have a big carbon footprint. So I am an international student and what makes that more difficult is I have family on two different continents. Um, so yes, I do fly unfortunately, but I am very aware of the environmental impact of that and I do try to offset that by consolidating trips and being very conscious about how I plan trips. Um, and I do know that some airlines do environmental like offsetting. Carbon offsetting, it's a great idea that uh, you plant trees or arrange for someone to plant trees on your behalf to suck up the CO2 that you'll be emitting on your next flight or when you burn fossil fuels for some reason. However, this method, while seemingly conscientious in its purpose, actually carries with it some potentially worrying negatives. Well firstly, there's real questions as to whether that £10 that you've spent will actually offset a tonne of carbon. Um, supposing it goes into tree planting, it's a real question as to whether those trees are going to survive and actually take up that ton of carbon that they claim it will. You only have to walk across Midsummer Common to see the trees that Cambridge City Council has planted to see that a number of them haven't survived. Um, and in a warming climate we don't know what's going to be the effect in terms of plant growth and sustainability. So there's a real issues there as to whether your money actually goes into something which will offset, offset carbon. It's a persuasive argument, um, but you also then have to think, but what do you do with the trees when they're fully grown? Do you then um, cut them down and use them as fuel, burn them? Well, then that CO2 goes back into the atmosphere again. It would then become a temporary solution. Or perhaps um, we use the carbon offsetting to uh, raise money to develop the techniques to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, engineering solutions. Well, that's great, but those, those solutions don't exist yet. And the Arctic is likely to be summarized free sometime in the next five years. We haven't got time to piss about with carbon offsetting, I'm afraid. We've got to be a bit more proactive. One issue is that carbon offsetting is potentially unethical, as it perpetuates a world in which only the wealthy and those who can afford carbon offset can use carbon. There is thus a fear of complacency, where those who are able to carbon offset will assume this is as effective as simply not emitting in the first place. Even if it worked, it's still encouraging you to continue with your high carbon lifestyle, you feel it's okay to fly to Prague on the weekend. The net effect of that is that the airlines feel, well, we need, more, we need to buy more planes because the demand is there. The government feels, well, we need to build more runways because the airlines are telling us that they've got they need more slots. So I think it's really dubious as to whether offsetting works at all and I suspect that actually it's worse than doing nothing. Just like not producing the waste in the first place rather than relying on recycling to solve the problem, not producing the carbon dioxide where possible is much more logical than producing it and trying to remove it later. There are many flights undertaken by members of the university which could be avoided, particularly for things like conferences and meetings which could be held over the internet nowadays, and the encouragement of non-essential exotic travel with travel grants. The statistics of annual emissions published by the university and other institutions only include their scope 2 emissions, the emissions produced on site and by their products, not scope 3 which would include the carbon production from transport taken by staff for university business. The demanders of the carbon production are not held responsible for the emissions, only the suppliers are. This is just one of the many areas where transparency needs to increase. Another major area where transparency is an issue is with the university's investments. In response to student emails calling for the transparency, the Freedom of Information team refused to share information about the Cambridge University Endowment Fund. The email stated, while we recognise the heightened nature of the debate about divestment at present, the University has concluded that there is no overriding interest in disclosure, given in particular the high degree of commercial prejudice to which disclosure would expose the University and all its fund managers and all the companies or funds in which it invests. When we started shooting this documentary in January, the Cambridge University had an endowment of £6.3 billion, making it the largest university endowment in Europe. Some is held in stocks and others in shares and property, however most of it is held indirectly via investment funds. 
This is common for universities, but the size of our investment and our reluctance to divest is leading to our environmental efforts being overshadowed by this dark cloud and outdone by other institutions such as Edinburgh, Cardiff, Angela Ruskin, Bristol, Nottingham and Durham, who have pledged divestment even just since this film started production. These universities remain financially successful. The Cambridge University Endowment Fund, CUEF, is the most significant pool of assets at £3 billion and is managed by the University Investment Office and mostly through a range of externally managed funds. So uh, we, f we know a lot about the university's investments. It's <laughs> one that make our business know about them. Um, I'll highlight two problems for you today. Uh, so firstly, the university invests mainly through fund managers, which isn't necessarily, necessarily a problem in itself. Um, so it gives its money to a fund manager or a series of fund managers, and then they invest it in the various uh, funds, so uh, investments that they have. Um, so the problem with this is that the university might not know what it's invested in. They know who they're invested with, but then they don't know the next step of the, the actual investments, um, which can be a bit tricky because a lot of fund managers prefer to work uh, with a very hands-off client. They prefer that their client just gives them the money and lets them get on with it. Whereas we want the university to really say, hang on, where's my money going? And tell me where it's going, and I want to tell you where, it's, where it shouldn't go, so it shouldn't go into arms, arms dealing or fossil fuels, for example. It has been estimated that between 3.5 to 6.4% of this endowment is invested in fossil funds. The inconsistencies of figures can arise depending on how broad your interpretation of fossil fuel industry is, but is indicative of the lack of transparency and awareness of exactly where the university's money is going. In November 2017, the Paradise Papers leak revealed the university holds substantial investments in offshore funds, avoiding taxes on hedge funds as well as investing in oil exploration and deep sea drilling. It also revealed past exposure to Collar International, a fund that invested almost a quarter of its capital in Royal Dutch Shell. So a part of the ex-paper revelations um, are just one more example of, of the crisis that we're facing. And I think that that is manifest in the lack of transparency that we have, the lack of accountability. No one really knew in the university that these investments were done through offshore funds, ditching uh, tax in the, in, on hedge funds in the US. Only very few people at the university knew that, not even some of the councillors at the university council. This lack of transparency questions the level of democracy in an institution that students pay to attend, the majority are over £9,000 a year. The Zero Carbon Group claim at least five separate Freedom of Information requests have been asked for with a transparent breakdown of the investment portfolio. None of these have been successful and there is an ongoing appeal. Other universities such as Edinburgh and Newcastle have provided this information in full. See, this university is not democratic. This university is controlled by very few people. It's very opaque. It's not, it's not accountable for its acts. So we have to radically change the way how we organise because this is not fair, this is not just and it is not democratic. Student groups have formed to try and promote sustainable investment in the university, taking different grassroots approaches. We want to kind of generate discussion and stimulate changes in the university with talking to staff and students and just engaging with the system and to try and kind of shape our investment policies and the way we do things with finance, so that we have a kind of fairer finance for the future. I suppose you know, our ultimate aim um, in the short term is for the University of Cambridge to divest fully from fossil fuels. So that's direct investments where the university is directly invested in fossil fuel companies and also indirectly where they invest in like, offshore funds uh, which would then invest in fossil fuel companies. Um, but I think more broadly we're kind of campaign about climate justice, um, a campaign that recognises that climate change disproportionately affects um, already marginalised communities in the global south. Um, so this is kind of like the way we choose to campaign on a kind of smaller scale. Both Zero Carbon and Positive Investment Cambridge were crucial in the creation of a working group to review the university's investments. However, in March, the working group's report was leaked to Varsity, stating only partial divestment would be advocated leading Zero Carbon's representative Alice to resign. This has led to escalation of action by Zero Carbon in particular. Along with staging a mock marriage ceremony between BP and the university, they held a divestment march which was attended by over 350 students and academics within the university who took to the streets to criticise the lack of democracy in the decision making process. On the day of the Oxford versus Cambridge boat race, Cambridge's Zero Carbon teamed up with the Oxford University Climate Justice campaign and dropped a banner with orange flares over Hammersmith Bridge as the men's team rode beneath with the stunt garnering attention from the public eye. 
They also handed a petition to those attending the April meeting with 1,249 signatures, over a thousand of those collected in the first day. In this specific case, what we're campaigning for, divestment from fossil fuel companies, this is a pretty urgent thing. Communities are already feeling the impact, you've already seen the increased rate of um, like unexpected weather patterns, and so it's kind of like, we don't have much time to waste. Um, and I also think even other change at Cambridge, like Cambridge is an inherently conservative um, institution, um, change takes time, it has that processes take a lot of time, it has to go through so much bureaucracy, and I just think if we're not being forceful, we're not being provocative, we're not being, you know, in, like maybe even to use your phrase, radical, then like it's just, the change isn't going to happen. I think also part of it is what we're dealing with in this university is a very untransparent, resistant, um, as you said, bureaucratic structure. They're very opaque about what they do. We don't have access to a lot of information. So whilst lobbying with them is actually very fundamental to what we do, because that's really what's pushing, that's what's pushed us forward a lot. It has to be alongside direct action, because that's how you build the pressure on the university. We've seen it so many other campaigns across the country. The high profile revelations of the university's associations with the fossil fuel industry call into question not just their commitment to being a world leading research institution in climate science and solutions, but also ethical issues with human rights abuses, with Shell's name often coupled with human rights abuses in recent years. Shell's oil spill in Bodo, Nigeria in 2008 and 2009 has not only caused extensive environmental damage but also affected an estimated 15,600 people and they are yet to clean up. Amnesty International pointed out in a report in July 2009 that Shell has failed to respect the human rights of the people in the Niger Delta through failure to prevent and mitigate pollution. Shell derives approximately 10% of its profits from the Niger Delta. Our new Vice-Chancellor, too has recently claimed that we need to be a social leader, yet we have lagged so far behind on such a major issue. The fossil fuel divestment movement is one of the fastest growing divestment movements in history. In late April, a meeting was held by the University Council to discuss the Working Group report. This meeting was followed by a direct threat from BP's Chief Executive, Bob Dudley, not to bow to the pressure of hundreds of students calling for divestment. It was announced that the University decided against divestment, causing outrage from students. Along with the groups like Zero Carbon and Positive Investment Cambridge tackling the divestment issue, there are some brilliant people driven to make great things happen at the university, working to make our university a greener institution. The next generation, our kids, and the generation after that, their kids, are um, hopefully going to inherit a planet which is as lovely as the one we've got now. The rate we're going though, they won't. Here we are in Cambridge, we're only a few metres above sea level. My guess is that in one or two hundred years this place will be underwater. Um, that's a bit of a shame really. I'd like to prevent that from happening. Because the scale and kind of rate of change that things have occurred can be really daunting but it's realising that even though it's global, everyone's individual actions, even if you change them a bit, will make a difference. Just knowing it's kind of a collective responsibility as well. So like, especially living in the UK, we definitely all do our bit to kind of work toward, not work towards, but we all harm the environment. So I want to make sure I reduce my impact on it and do everything I can to try and reverse what we've already done. So my main motivation is that I think like a lot of other young people, I often feel powerless and out of control over such a huge global issue as climate change and doing these little daily contributions help me, helps me feel, I guess, more empowered. Although there's still a lot to be achieved, the University of Cambridge is addressing its environmental impact. The University has seen a reduction in its waste production over the last few years. So excluding construction waste, we produced around 3,400 tonnes of waste last year. Um, the year before last, we, about 2,000 tonnes of that was going to landfill. Um, one thing we did was we changed our waste contract so that that waste uh, now goes to energy from waste. So we've reduced the amount of waste going to landfill down to around about 70 tonnes um, because that waste is, is being turned to energy instead. Um, another thing we did was we introduced food waste collections. So we found that quite a large proportion of the waste that was going to landfill was food waste. So by introducing a food waste collection and sending that to anaerobic digestion, we're generating energy from that as well.
apps, however, are not being visibly sold in many colleges or on-site cafes anymore. And some cafes, like the Art Cafe on the Sidrick site, only offers takeout cups. We can only imagine how many cups they go through a day. The university has also introduced vegware products. According to the Environment and Energy Department, as well as reducing plastic waste, this switch has saved nine tonnes of carbon in the last six months of 2017, as vegware produ products have a lower amount of embodied carbon than plastic or paper equivalents. That's the equivalent of 16 flights from New York to London. Many students do not realise that these products should not go into the recycling bins as they're non-recyclable. Vegware products are designed to break down within 12 weeks in commercial composting facilities, but the restricted oxygen and moisture levels of landfill mean that breakdown occurs much slower, as there's much lower microbial activity. Instead, according to the waste management team, vegware and food waste that can be is sent to be aerob anaerobically digested, where it mostly breaks down and that which is not is compressed and burnt for fuel. If the vegware product is clean, it won't break down properly. However, if it has a food product on it and it is put in a food bin, it will begin to break down even anaerobically. There are currently no compost or even food waste bins in most student accommodations, as colleges have autonomy, so they do not have to accept the uni policy. This being said, the university's environment and energy section has done some great work implementing policies to reduce energy use and carbon emissions and tries to positively embed a culture of sustainable behaviours among the student population that hopefully will have a wider impact on the long term. Our department uh, mainly run an initiative called Green Impact um, and throughout the year we encourage departments and colleges to take part in that to improve their own environmental performance and then we have an awards ceremony at the end of the year for those who took part. Green Impact is kind of a student-led initiative to try and make the whole university greener but through its individual sections. Yeah so it can be colleges or departments or kind of working with each other and against them as well. It's kind of like a competition to motivate towards changing things. Each college or department is given a set of targets and then you can work as a team like hopefully with those with people and um, try and reach those in whatever way you can to be greener. We work with the college to try and implement change in the kind of wider policies they employ. So trying to get like renewable energy in our houses and improve recycling throughout the college and things like that. So it's kind of beyond just the group itself and the college as a whole. We also run events throughout the year focused on particular issues like waste, um, travel, um, energy, things like that. Um, so we'll be going around the university departments and um, having little roadshow events and raising awareness of those issues. One of the other ways in which the university is having a positive impact is through its climate lecture series which was launched in 2017 and addresses climate change from a variety of narratives in the hope of public awareness of the dangers we face as a planet and engaging with the young audience. Guest speakers present their take on a particular aspect of climate change and although the current state of our global climate is discussed, it is in the possible solutions and actions that we need to take that are most strongly emphasised. About Five or six years ago, I got caught up in a project involving geoengineering, which is about how we might cool the planet if we fail to meet our CO2 emissions targets. And I, I realised that I just didn't know very much about climate change, and I had to get up to speed on climate change. And then realising that nobody else knows very much about climate change, that we ought to be communicating the important issues. So that's really how Cambridge Climate Lecture Series began. And then suddenly I began to think, how about if we try to combine these things and use the talks that are going on in Cambridge, use live streaming so that they'll be available to anybody anywhere in the world who had an internet connection, and use social media so that it wasn't just Cambridge broadcasting to the world, but it would be a case of being able to interact in real time to ask questions of the speakers. So that was, that was the idea of it. For example, one of our partners, Climate Tracker, organized live screenings in places such as Nepal and other places. So it's a great sort of engagement and outreach activity for young people who are going to be the most affected by climate change. Within the student body at Cambridge, there is also a lot being done to raise awareness about climate change. The Cambridge Climate and Sustainability Forum is a one-day annual forum organised by a group of Cambridge University students and run in partnership with the Cambridge Hub. The forum is aimed at increasing awareness of climate change, sustainability and 21st century environmental challenges. 
Um, it's a one-day conference with some talks and workshops, and it's an annual event. It's organised through the Cambridge Hub as well, which is like a kind of charity, uh, which basically gathers together all forms of student charity in Cambridge and like helps to organise things like this. It's trying to raise awareness of like how people can be more sustainable and obviously know about what's going on with the environment and global warming. Um, but we're also sort of aiming to try and engage people with what they can do next. So we yeah. have some workshops and things that they can sign up for to learn more about sort of the next steps. I think it's, uh, it's not just about informing people, it's about um, kind of engaging them and uh, hopefully making them leave inspired to, to do more. The theme of this um, this year's forum has also been to like um, have like a celebration of all the positive things that have been done so far um, in the sustainability movement, and like encourage people of how far we have come, and then to think about looking forward to how we can continue to bring positive change in the future. There are so many individuals in this university dedicated to tackling the climate crisis that we are currently facing. Those featured in this film, to name but a few. Yet yeah, these actions are undermined by the decision makers in the university. As one student reminds us, we can't let these negative decisions to be continually made. What would be your one piece of advice to someone wanting to become more environmentally friendly? Uh, get a job where you get to make many decisions and then make those decisions as environmentally sustainable as possible. I think individual action is very important, um, but is stronger when it's collective action. And the more people we have who care about these issues, who are in positions where they get to make decisions and decide, right, we are going to not be serving uh, meat every single day in this large workplace cafeteria, we are going to be signed up to a renewable energy company, we are not going to be taking excessive numbers of flights. If you get to be someone who gets to make those decisions, uh, I think that's a huge way and a really good lever of being able to bring about change. When asking our new Vice-Chancellor for a comment, none was received. Putting pressure on powerful bodies is a highly important individual action because the waste and CO2 produced by companies from food outlets to universities to fossil fuel companies is vastly greater than one individual can cut down. Using your power as a consumer, be that of energy, food, plastics or any other commodity, is one way of sending your message to those making decisions. Yeah, because environmentalism is a lot more than just simply recycling <laughs> and um, going, going vegan and things like that. It's about a, a global movement and so we're really trying to engage with that and get students involved and motivated. Mm. Here's some advice from the eco community in Cambridge of how you can help clean up this ecological mess on an everyday basis. Try and make a couple of small changes and then make them into habits. Be thinking about what they buy. Um, so it's about, for instance, using keep cups instead of using disposable cups, but also buying high quality items that will last for a long time. Um, and of course, making sure that uh, you recycle things at the end of their life. So we're made to want so many new things. And I think there's such a merit in kind of stepping back and like appreciating what you already have or like finding ways to, to make things that you already have better or what you want and yeah, that kind of thing. I think that's, it's, it doesn't have to be kind of boring, it can be quite fun and creative to, to reuse things in, in different ways. As well as your day-to-day -day travel, using cycling, walking, public transport, one of the big ones is air travel. Don't take a car when you can go by bike, don't take a plane if you don't need, really need to. Try to avoid unsustainable forms of transport as much as possible, so if you can cycle rather than get a bus or a taxi or drive, then cycle. and. Even though it can be hard, like try to avoid flying if at all possible. So if there's the alternative of getting a train or a, a ship, then <laughs> or not travelling at all, then that's obviously better. It's about uh, turning down the thermostat and wearing a jumper. It's about taking shorter showers. It's about putting lids on pans. Quite simple things, but um, once you get in the habit, it can save quite a lot of energy. Switch off the light when you leave the room. I think this is actually like probably the easiest thing to do, especially with communal living it's quite easy to just leave the lights on because you assume that someone else will be in it in a minute. So one of the big things you can do is uh, actually eat less ruminant meat in particular um, and eat basically more plant-based foods. Eat less or no meat. Definitely cut off meat consumption. And not to listen to people that try and tell you it's not worth it. So you'll do a small change and someone says, oh, what difference is that going to make? But when everyone does them, they make a huge difference. So have courage in your convictions and go with what you think is right.